Good evening, everyone. Welcome back to Rose Hill. And uh, uh, there's one or two announcements I neglected to mention this morning. Uh, and the super important one is that next Sunday is Fellowship Meal Sunday. So uh, don't forget, uh, you all know how that works, but uh, third Sunday of the month, and we're back on that schedule. So uh, uh, just make plans for that if you're able. And also, uh, this was an announcement in the bulletin last week. I don't think it was in the bulletin this morning, but uh, on the 21st, uh, Mr. Or Hunter's parents are kind of putting on a reception for him because of his seminary graduation. Uh, it w they would appreciate it if, uh, if you're planning to come, if you would sign up on the sign-up sheets that are somewhere around the building. Um, uh, just so they have a, an idea of numbers for that. I know some of you all have. Um, but anyway, just a reminder, if you are planning to come and haven't done that yet, please, uh, please do sign up there. That would be helpful. I think that's all for announcements. Is there anything else that needs to be mentioned? Uh, all right. Uh, our call to worship this evening comes from Numbers chapter 24. How lovely are your tents, O Jacob, your encampments, O Israel. Like palm groves that stretch afar, like gardens beside a river, like aloes that the Lord has planted, like cedar trees beside the waters. And uh, we are looking at the tent of uh, the tabernacle, the tent of meeting in the book of Exodus in our studies. And uh, so that's uh, just a reflection on that, that that is a lovely, lovely thing, the Lord's house. Let's uh, enjoy being in the Lord's house this evening. Let's begin our service tonight by standing and we'll sing hymn number 349, O Thou Who the Shepherd of Israel Art, 349. Let's stand together and sing. Together. Heavenly Father, we thank you that uh, we can live in the light of your face. We do call on your name this evening, knowing that you are mighty to save, you are uh, loving to comfort, you are gracious to strengthen your people, and we pray, Lord, that we might uh, know all those things and uh, the fullness of your character and your deeds uh, this evening. Would you uh, truly meet with us here in the sanctuary as your people 
We thank you for the fact that you uh, condescended, you came down, uh, you sent your son from heaven that he might dwell uh, among us as Emmanuel. May we know the real truth of that this evening, and we pray this in his name. Amen. Please be seated. So we have just two weeks left on Exodus, and we have two chapters left. And as I thought about it, I decided it would work best, again, to have two long readings tonight, and so that next week our reading will be very short, just the last section uh, next week. Uh, next week's service is primarily going to be consist of a hymn sing, uh, so you know, uh, taking requests, and so there will be a short message to conclude our study of the book of Exodus. Uh, so again, uh, we'll have a couple of long readings and we'll intersperse that with the hymn. We're in the middle of a section that narrates the construction of the tabernacle and all its furnishings and our first reading tonight, which is Exodus 39, uh, uh, focuses on the priestly clothing. So let's uh, read Exodus chapter 39. From the blue and purple and scarlet yarns they made finely woven garments for ministering in the holy place. They made the holy garments for Aaron as the Lord had commanded Moses. He made the ephod of gold, blue and purple and scarlet yarns and fine twined linen. And they hammered out gold leaf and he cut it into threads to work into the blue and purple and the scarlet yarns and into the fine twined linen in skilled design. They made for the ephod attaching shoulder pieces joined to it at its two edges, and the skillfully woven band on it was of one piece with it and made like it of gold, blue, and purple, and scarlet yarns and fine twined linen as the Lord had commanded Moses. They made the onyx stones enclosed in settings of gold filigree and engraved like the engravings of a signet according to the names of the sons of Israel, and he set them on the shoulder pieces of the ephod to be stones of remembrance for the sons of Israel as the Lord had commanded Moses. He made the breastpiece in skilled work in the style of the ephod of gold, blue, and purple, and scarlet yarns and fine twined linen. It was square. They made the breastpiece doubled, a span its length and a span its breadth when doubled. And they set in it four rows of stones. A row of sardius, topaz, and carbuncle was the first row. And the second row, an emerald, a sapphire, and a diamond. And the third row, a jacinth, an agate, and an amethyst, and the fourth row, a barrel, an onyx, and a jasper. They were enclosed in settings of gold filigree. There were 12 stones with their names according to the names of the sons of Israel. They were like signets, each engraved with its name for the 12 tribes, and they made on the breastpiece breast twisted chains like cords of pure gold. And they made two settings of gold filigree and two gold rings and put the two rings on the two edges of the breastpiece, and they put the two cords of gold in the two rings at the edges of the breastpiece. They attached the two ends of the two cords to the two settings of filigree. They, thus they attached it in front so the shoulder pieces of, to the shoulder pieces of the ephod. Then they made two rings of gold and put them at the two ends of the breastpiece on its inside edge next to the ephod. And they made two rings of gold and attached them in front to the lower part of the two shoulder pieces of the ephod at its seam above the skillfully woven band of the ephod. And they bound the breastpiece by its rings to the rings of the ephod with a lace of blue so that it should lie on the skillfully woven band of the ephod and that the breastpiece should not come loose from the ephod as the Lord had commanded Moses. He also made the robe of the ephod woven all of blue and the opening of the robe in it was like the opening in a garment with a binding around the opening so that it might not tear. On the hem of the robe, they made pomegranates of blue and purple and scarlet yarns and fine twined linen. They also made bells of pure gold and put the bells between the pomegranates all around the hem of the robe between the pomegranates, a bell and a pomegranate, a bell and a pomegranate around the hem of the robe for ministering as the Lord had commanded Moses. They also made the coats woven of fine linen for Aaron and his sons and the turban of fine linen, and the caps of fine linen, and the linen undergarments of fine twined linen, and the sash of fine twined linen, and a blue and purple and scarlet yarns embroidered with needlework as the Lord had commanded Moses. They made the plate of the holy crown of pure gold and wrote on it an inscription like the engraving of a signet, holy to the Lord. And they tied it to a cord of blue to fasten it on the turban above as the Lord had commanded Moses. 
Thus all the work of the tabernacle of the tent of meeting was finished, and the people of Israel did according to all that the Lord had commanded Moses. So they did. Then they brought the tabernacle to Moses, the tent and all its utensils, its hooks, its frames, its bars, its pillars, and its bases, the covering of tanned ram skins and goat skins, and the veil of the screen, the ark of the testimony with its poles and the mercy seat, the table with all its utensils, and the bread of the presence, the lampstand of pure gold, and its lamps with the lamps set, and all its utensils, and the oil for the light, the golden altar, the anointing oil, and the fragrant incense, and the screen for the entrance of the tent, the bronze altar and its grating of bronze, its poles and all its utensils, the basin and its stand, the hangings of the court, its pillars and its bases, and the screen for the gate of the court, its cords and its pegs, and all the utensils for the service of the tabernacle for the tent of meeting, the finely worked garments for ministering in the holy place, the holy garments for Aaron the priest, and the garments of his sons for their service as priests, According to all that the Lord had commanded Moses, so the people of Israel had done all the work. And Moses saw all the work, and behold, they had done it as the Lord had commanded, so they had done it. Then Moses blessed them. Let's uh, take a uh, pause there to stand and sing, and we'll sing a hymn about uh, the scriptures. It's number 94, How Firm a Foundation, number 94. continue on reading in Exodus chapter 40 and we'll read verses 1 through 33. So getting close to the end, but like I said, uh, we'll finish it off uh, next week. But uh, for this evening, uh, verses 1 through 33 of chapter 40. The Lord spoke to Moses saying, on the first day of the first month, you shall erect the tabernacle of the tent of meeting and you shall put in it the ark of the testimony and you shall screen the ark with the veil. And you shall bring in the table and arrange it, and you shall bring in the lampstand and set up its lamps. 
And you shall put the golden altar for incense before the ark of the testimony and set up the screen for the door of the tabernacle. You shall set the altar of burnt offering before the door of the tabernacle of the tent of meeting and place the basin between the tent of meeting and the altar and put water in it. And you shall set up the court all around and hang up the screen for the gate of the court. Then you shall take the anointing oil and anoint the tabernacle and all that is in it and consecrate it and all its furniture so that it may become holy. You shall also anoint the altar of burnt offering and all its utensils and consecrate the altar so that the altar may become most holy. You shall also anoint the basin and its stand and consecrate it. Then you shall bring Aaron and his sons to the entrance of the tent of meeting and shall wash them with water and put on Aaron the holy garments. And you shall anoint him and consecrate him that he may serve me as priest. You shall bring his sons also and put coats on them and anoint them as you anointed their father, that they may serve me as priests. And their anointing shall admit them to a perpetual priesthood throughout their generations. This Moses did according to all that the Lord commanded him. So he did. In the first month, in the second year, on the first day of the month, the tabernacle was erected. Moses erected the tabernacle. He laid its bases and set up its frames and put in its poles and raised up its pillars. And he spread the tent over the tabernacle and put the covering of the tent over it as the Lord had commanded Moses. He took the testimony and put it into the ark and put the poles on the ark and set the mercy seat above on the ark. And he brought the ark into the tabernacle and set up the veil of the screen and screened the ark of the testimony as the Lord had commanded Moses. He put the table in the tent of meeting on the north side of the tabernacle outside the veil and arranged the bread on it before the Lord as the Lord had commanded Moses. He put the lampstand in the tent of meeting opposite the table on the south side of the tabernacle and he set up the lamps before the Lord as the Lord had commanded Moses. He put the golden altar in the tent of meeting before the veil and burned fragrant incense on it as the Lord had commanded Moses. He put in place the screen for the door of the tabernacle. He set the altar of burnt offering at the entrance of the tabernacle of the tent of meeting and offered on it the burnt offering and the grain offering as the Lord had commanded Moses. He set the basin between the tent of meeting and the altar and put water in it for washing with which Moses and Aaron and his sons washed their hands and their feet. When they went into the tent of meeting and when they approached the altar, they washed as the Lord commanded Moses. And he erected the court around the tabernacle and the altar and set up the screen of the gate of the court. So Moses finished the work. Let's pray together. Heavenly Father, we are thankful for your word, which is a firm foundation for us. And again, Lord, as we read through these chapters, uh, sometimes full of details and sometimes uh, seemingly uh, repetitive, uh, Lord, we pray that we still might find a blessing in them, uh, for we know that uh, you had them inspired uh, by your uh, spirit to be a blessing to us. Lord, uh, we do pray that you would speak to us, that we might learn and grow as your people. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Uh, well, you've heard the old saying, clothes make the man. I learned this past week that uh, that saying probably originated with Shakespeare, figures. Um, so in the play Hamlet, uh, Polonius, he urges Laertes, his son, to dress well uh, you know, in fine clothes because he says, apparel oft proclaims the man. Uh, now there have been some very humorous uh, variations on the saying, clothes make the man. Uh, Herbert Harold Vreeland, uh, who was the president of several successful railway companies in the 19th century. He once said, clothes don't make a man, but clothes have got many a man a good job. Uh, and then there was Mark Twain, uh, who once observed, clothes make the man, naked people have little or no influence in society. <laughs> but seriously, folks, um, it really is true that clothes sometimes make the man. I have the option of whether or not to lead worship and preach in clerical garb, collar or robe on Sunday mornings. I think there's general wisdom uh, principles that encourage uh, uh, ministers wearing uh, ministerial garb, but I wouldn't say that a pastor who doesn't do that is sinning in some way. 
But for the Old Testament high priest, the situation was different. It would have been a sin for the high priest to attempt to carry out his duties in uh, the sanctuary without wearing his specific priestly garb, and that's why it's so detailed uh, in the book of Exodus. It was absolutely required. It was not optional. And that's because the high priest's clothes are so full of symbolism. And Exodus chapter 39, uh, which we read, tells us all about the preparation of the priest's clothes, uh, mostly focusing on the high priest and the various parts of his garments, a few, gar a few comments about uh, coats for Aaron's sons. Um, and earlier in this series on Exodus, we looked at the instructions for these clothes and we talked about the various symbolic parts uh, to them. You know, the fact that the names of the tribes, all 12 tribes, they're inscribed on these gemstones, so on kind of the shoulders and then on the breast uh, plate. Uh, so whenever the priest goes into the sanctuary to minister, uh, he's representing, he's kind of embodying the whole nation before God. And so uh, we understand that kind of symbolism uh, that, was, uh, that was just kind of wrapped into the clothing there. So uh, interesting that here at the very end of the book of Exodus, very climax of the book, it uh, focuses on the high priest. And that's telling you something, that's telling you that the work of the high priest really is essential for the life and the faith of uh, God's people. You know, the, the tabernacle, it was not just meant to be a, uh, like a museum or an art gallery, you know, full of these beautiful things that, you know, people could come and stand around and admire and go ooh and ah. Um, the, the tabernacle, it's supposed to be a place of activity and it needs to be manned by a high priest who is an agent of redemption. And uh, uh, hopefully you already you know, can kind of see this coming, but ultimately this is all pointing to the work of Christ, the great high priest who uh, uh, brings about redemption in uh, the heavenly sanctuary. I mean, the work of Jesus, that's the whole message of the Bible, Old Testament to New Testament. And so we're getting... It uh, kind of prefigured here in the tabernacle system. So Exodus 39, it, uh, a lot of it talks about the making of the priest's clothing, and I didn't want to go back and review all of that and all the symbolism and stuff because we've talked about that before. I do want to focus a little more on verses 32 through 43 of chapter 39. And that's this kind of summarizing statement, uh, summarizing how everything that the Lord had commanded uh, was made. Uh, and uh, verses 42, 43 kind of summarize it. According to all that the Lord had commanded Moses, so the people of Israel had done all the work. And Moses saw all the work, and behold, they had done it as the Lord had commanded, so they had done it. Then Moses blessed them. Now I wonder if when you hear those verses, if that maybe sounds like something that you've heard before in the Bible. Uh, a number of commentators uh, have pointed out that when you read those verses, it sounds an awful lot like the Lord's work of creation in Genesis 1 and Genesis 2. You remember there we read that the Lord saw this work that he did, this work he created, and behold, it was very good. Uh, just like Moses sees all the work, and Moses blesses the Israelites when they've done all this, just as the Lord blessed the world that he created. Uh, Genesis 1, verse 22, he blessed the animals and the birds. Genesis 1, 28, he blesses mankind. And then in Genesis 2, starting in verse 1, thus the heavens and the earth were finished and all the host of them. And on the seventh day, the Lord finished his work that he had done and rested on the seventh day from all his work that he had done. So God blessed the seventh day. Right there, that text says, you know, the Lord finished his work. Genesis 2, verse 2, just like Exodus 40, verse 33, says that Moses finished the work. It all it kind of evokes Genesis 1 and 2 and the creation story, and there's other ways that it does that as well. Um, and I'll talk a bit more about that in just a sec, but really the, uh, what we're supposed to uh, glean from this is that the tabernacle, it's kind of a miniature model or picture of the world, the cosmos. 
It's depicting a good, holy world as it's been restored by God's grace. You think about the world that God created in Genesis 1 and 2. God made all things. It was all very good. Uh, but he, he then tasked Adam and Eve to work the ground, exercise dominion, and in effect, he was telling them to extend the garden. And the Garden of Eden, it was a kind of sanctuary, kind of tabernacle, where the Lord dwelt. And I've talked about that theme in previous sermons as well. Uh, we've talked about how the sanctuary has all of this garden imagery in it of trees and pomegranates and so on. And uh, the Lord's presence uh, right at the heart of it. Uh, so, you know, you have all these component parts there in Genesis 1 and 2. Everything's created, but it still needs to be shaped and cultivated further and extended so that ultimately the whole world is supposed to become the dwelling place of God. And uh, here in Exodus, you know, we're kind of seeing that uh, uh, some assembly is required as they the ads will tell us. You get through chapter 39, everything's been created, all the stuff has been constructed, built, the sanctuary curtains, the altars, the tables, lampstands, the priestly clothing, but it all still needs to be put together. And uh, as we read in chapter 40, uh, again, it's kind of evocative of Genesis 1, Genesis 2, as the Lord is creating things, but then he's also, you know, dividing things and shaping things and creating dry land and then creating creatures to live on the dry land. And he opens up the skies and creates birds to live in the skies and creates the seas and creates the uh, sea creatures to live in the seas and so on. And, you know, uh, arranging things, ordering things, putting things into their proper place. And, uh, it, well, this will speak to my family. It may not it may speak to some of yours. It's like coming home from Ikea with a piece of furniture. You know, here's the box, it's all the parts, but you need to put them all together to make them functional. And that's what leads from chapter 39 into chapter 40, because chapter 40, verses 1 through 33, that's where everything is finally put together, assembled, and then the tabernacle is created. And again, all these echoes of the creation narrative here, Exodus 40, verse 22, says that it, uh, the tabernacle is to be erected on the first day of the first month. It's the beginning of time. It's the beginning of creation, the beginning of the Genesis story. In the beginning, God created. First day ever. Um, and so on the first day of the year, the tabernacle is to be brought into existence. Exodus 40 also talks about as Moses is putting things together, he's, uh, 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 he's supposed to anoint everything with this holy anointing oil. It's used to consecrate everything in the tabernacle, all the furniture, the clothing, everything. Uh, pouring oil on something or someone, consecrating something with oil, that's an image of the Holy Spirit. Um, that's why it's, it's uh, holy oil and it makes things holy. Uh, this is why the scriptures will talk in various places about the Holy Spirit being poured out. It's like the Holy Spirit is this liquid. Um, it's all imagery, of course, but uh, uh, hopefully you, you can get that picture in your mind. And, well, you think about it. When the Lord created the heavens and the earth in the very beginning, Genesis 1, verse 1, what does the next verse say? And the Spirit of God was hovering over the waters. And uh, we get this notion here that the Spirit is kind of hovering over the tabernacle as it's being raised up on the first day of the first month of the year, the beginning of the year. It's all anointed with oil. It's uh, invoking the idea of the Spirit, the Holy Spirit, kind of hovering over everything, over this new world. Moses sets up these lamps in the sanctuary, chapter 40, verse 24. He puts the bread of the presence uh, on the special table, verse 23. And you think again of Genesis chapter 1, where God creates these lights to shine light upon the world, and he uh, causes the earth to bring forth food. 
It's the same word. Uh, you could translate it bread uh, in Genesis 1, but there it's more generally food. But, uh, and we also have, it talks about Aaron and his sons. They're washed. They're clothed with the garments of the priesthood and uh, kind of allowed to enter into this uh, tabernacle sanctuary, kind of like a new Adam walking in the garden again. So the tabernacle, it really is meant to be kind of a picture of the world in miniature, the world as it was originally, holy and good. Uh, it also depicts the world as it's being redeemed from the fall and glorified because uh, sin has entered into the world. And really, you know, the whole history of mankind, it's getting, it gets played out in the tabernacle from creation to the fall into sin to redemption in Christ to glorification, to union, communion with God. All of that gets played out in the tabernacle, in the sanctuary. And you know, Christian worship today is no different in any of those uh, respects. And we don't have the elaborate altars and curtains and, and incense and all that sort of thing. But still, the history of mankind it gets played out in the worship of God's people. Creation, fall, redemption, consummation, communion with God. And uh, this is why gospel-structured worship is so important, and it needs to be a priority for us. I know I'm preaching to the choir here. You're all here on a Sunday evening, uh, second worship service, but uh, uh, this is why it is so important. Uh, uh, we need that gospel structure to be impressed upon us uh, over and over again. Uh, we live in an amazingly complex world. We're always getting fed all sorts of false and deceptive messages. And there's so many things trying to capture our attention, capture our hearts. And, uh, you know, we are very willing to be captured sometimes. And, and we need this basic gospel-structured worship to keep us grounded, to keep our heads on straight, and to keep our spiritual vision clear and sharp so that, so that we can live fruitful Christian lives and joyful Christian lives in a spiritually hostile world. This world with devils filled that threatens to undo us, as Martin Luther's hymn says. We need to enter into the sanctuary of God, wherever that happens to be, whatever the address is, in order to be grounded in God's truth and God's uh, reality. In his book, God in the Dock, C.S. Lewis, he addresses a question someone asked him once. Someone asked him, is attendance at a place of worship or membership with a Christian community necessary to a Christian way of life? Now, Lewis began his answer to that question very modestly, I think a little too modestly, actually. Uh, he started out by saying, that's a question which I cannot answer. Well, okay. Uh, Lewis was a very, aware, a very aware of being a Christian layman, not a uh, clergyman, and not trained and ordained as a minister, as a priest. So I think he felt unqualified to make kind of a binding pronouncement about Christian practices. So that's why he, I think he starts out you know, very humbly like that. Uh, but he begins by saying, well, I can't answer that question. Then he actually does go on to answer the question. So you know, um, he gives more of an answer. Uh, but he does it by reflecting on his own experience as to whether or not attending worship and gathering with the church was necessary for him anyway. And this is what he says, kind of a longish uh, quote. He says, my own experience is that when I first became a Christian about 14 years ago, I thought that I could do it on my own by retiring to my rooms and reading theology and I wouldn't go to the churches and gospel halls. And then later I found that it was the only way of flying your flag. And of course, I found that this meant being a target. It is extraordinary how inconvenient to your family it becomes for you to get up early to go to church. It doesn't matter so much if you get up early for anything else, but if you get up early to go to church, it's very selfish of you and you upset the house. If there's anything in the teaching of the New Testament which is in the nature of a command, 
It is that you are obliged to take the sacrament, and you can't do it without going to church. And then he gets very honest here. I disliked very much their hymns, which I considered to be fifth-rate poems set to sixth-rate music. But as I went on, I saw the great merit of it. I came up against different people of quite different outlooks and different education, and then gradually my conceit just began peeling off. I realized that the hymns, which were just sixth-rate music, were nevertheless being sung with devotion and benefit by an old saint in work boots in the opposite pew. And then you realize you aren't fit to clean those boots. It gets you out of your solitary conceit. Now, I don't know what hymns in particular C.S. Lewis was singing in church. I feel like we have something better than fifth-rate poems and sixth-rate music, but, uh, but you see the point, I think. Lewis is saying with great humility that Christians need to be at church and they need to participate in worship. Obviously, unless you're Robinson Crusoe and you're stranded all alone on a desert island and, you know, you just can't get there. It's just totally impossible. Okay. But uh, except for, you know, weird you know, situations like that, gathering together for Christian worship is necessary. That's where we experience the fellowship of the saints. And it sanctifies us. It's where we experience that special meeting between the Lord and his people. I've talked about that a lot in this series as we've looked at the tabernacle. But it's also, as C.S. Lewis points out, it's where we learn to serve others with humility and we learn how to clean their boots. So, yes, we absolutely do need to attend corporate worship with the Christian community because we can't go it alone. Uh, we are on a pilgrimage together. We're meant to worship together. And uh, it, it takes eyes of faith to see it, but to, this is where the action happens. It really is. God's sanctuary is the beachhead for the kingdom of God's invasion into this world. That's why you need to be here. The epistle to the Hebrews says, let us consider how to stir up one another to love and good works, not neglecting to meet together as is the habit of some, but encouraging one another and all the more as you see the day drawing near. Well, indeed, brothers and sisters, let's not neglect meeting together. Let's encourage one another because the day is always drawing nearer. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for the uh, encouragement. For some of us, sometimes we need a rebuke to uh, be more diligent in gathering with your people. Uh, sometimes we need uh, the, just the reminder of what a blessing it can be to gather in your house uh, with your saints, uh, the people that you've chosen and the ones that you've chosen to walk along uh, with each one of us. Lord, we thank you how you have brought together the body and uh, this particular uh, church body, Rose Hill, Lord, with uh, all the parts uh, that are needed and necessary. And we pray, Lord, that we might more and more learn how to serve one another and to serve you and that we would uh, truly uh, find your sanctuary, your tent to be a lovely dwelling place. We pray you would uh, work that kind of perspective in us. And we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's conclude our service tonight with uh, one of the uh, favorite evening hymns that we use, 401, All Praise to Thee, My God, This Night. 401, let's rise and sing.
the Lord go with you as you go from here. I know some of us are uh, beginning travels this week, and so we pray the Lord will uh, keep all of us safe and will watch over all of us. Receive the Lord's benediction. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face to shine upon you and to be gracious to you. The Lord turn his face towards you and grant you peace. Amen. Amen.